So if you have your Bible, if you will, let's first turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Give you just a minute to find that. And will I thus pray? God assumes you're going to pray. He doesn't say if you pray, but He says, When thou dost pray, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and in the corners of the market, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou pray, enter, in, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetition as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for much, for much speaking. Be ye therefore, he said, not like unto them. Now let's turn over, if you will, to the book of James. And here's what James has to say. James 4, 2 and 3. James says, You lust and you have not. You kill and you desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight wars and you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask to miss that you may consume it upon yourself. Terrible things happen to you if you don't pray. Terrible things will happen to you if you don't pray. God designed us to be praying people. When you got saved, a lot of things came to your corner. There's a lot of privileges that God gave you when you got saved. Sorry to say, a lot of us don't take advantages of all the privilege that God gave us when we, when we got saved. Now the world looks at Christianity with a, with a strange blimp look in that they think when you get saved, life is over. It's dull. It's boring. Listen, you don't start living, man, until you get saved. Amen. You don't know what life's all about until Jesus comes into, you, into your heart. We can read the Bible, God's love letter to us. We have no desire to read it. At least most, most people don't when they lost. And when they do read it, they're reading a historical book. They're not connecting spiritually. But when we get saved, we read God's love letter. It speaks to us. Amazing thing is how fresh it is. Every time we open it, you can read John 3.16. You can read it every day of your life and it will speak to you in a different manner every single day. Why is that? Because the Bible is a living Word of God. God blessed us with a church or fellowship with other Christians that strengthen us and pray for us. God, God gives us the ability to give and to serve. But the sweetest privilege, privilege that God gave you is the privilege of prayer. That's the best thing God has done for you other than saving your soul. He has given you the privilege of prayer. And there is power in prayer. There is power in a Christian's life. There is power just in your presence. I read about uh, a man named Philip. Philip Brooks was pastor of the First Baptist Church in Boston many, many years ago. Editorial in the Boston Times said, it was a dark and gloomy day yesterday until Philip Brooks walked through the room. Folks, that's the way a Christian ought to be. Amen. We got power in our presence, just our presence among people. There is power in that. And there's power in what a man says. Can you imagine? Think of all the great preachers that's lived through all the history of Christianity. Think of all the great men of God that have that have that have taken the world and rocked it toward God. Think of all the words they had to say that the people were blessed by who listened. But think of smaller churches, smaller congregations, unknown preachers. 
unknown like leaves off a tree that's blowing from here and there. But yet, the words make an impression on the people. You are blessed by the Sunday school teachers. You are blessed by the discipleship training teachers. You are blessed by every word that comes to you regardless of the mouth if it's about God. And then there's power in what we do. The Bible says, Jesus went about doing good. The problem with many of us today, we just go about. <laughs> we just go about kind of on a neutral ground, not good or bad, but just, just go about. But the Bible said Jesus went about doing good. Billy Graham's dream was to be a big, a, was to be a major league baseball player. That was his dream. But then he got saved. And God changed his direction. He may have been one of the greatest baseball players in all history. But he could never have blessed people. He could never have blessed the world the way he did when he delivered the messages of God. Amen. The message came to hear. There's power in what we give. What we give may seem like a meager amount. But yet God takes that and God blesses it. And we're able to send missionaries. We're able to support churches. We're able to do all the things that one person by himself could never do. But the greatest power you have, let me say this again, is the power of prayer. When you get on your knees or whatever position you want to get in to address God, remember now, you're talking to a person. You're, it's a deity, but it's a person. And you express your desires. You express your concern. But you know what the devil's doing the whole time you're doing that? He's shaking all the way down to his toes. He is scared to death. When you start praying, I'll tell you, he starts leaving. When you start praying, he will flee from you, the Bible says. Kingdoms are won. Souls are saved. Churches are built. Lives are blessed. People are healed. Prodigals are brought home. Homes are put back together. Marriages are reaffirmed. How? By prayer. Now then, first of all, what does the Bible promise concerning prayer? What does it promise us? What can I depend on the Bible? Can I depend on the Bible? Folks, if I can't depend on the Bible, I can't depend on nothing. My hopes and my dreams is built upon the Bible. The first thing and the greatest need you have, the Bible promises us forgiveness of our sins. That's the greatest need you have. You may think, well, no, I'm behind the house payment. Listen, that ain't the greatest need you got. Or you may think, well, I'm, I'm sick. That healing is not the greatest need you have. Here's what the Bible says. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. David sinned against God and he prayed in Psalms 51, Have mercy on me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. He's simply saying, God, I need your forgiveness. I need my sins erased. But not only that, not only that, he will provide for you a supply of wisdom. A supply of wisdom. The Bible says, if any man like wisdom, let him ask God who gives abundantly to us. Now what is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge as best pleases God and benefits your fellow man. Your fellow man. That's as clear a definition I can give of wisdom. Some of the most simple-minded folks you ever saw in your life has wisdom. The, the people that I remember from my childhood, those overall wares, those uh, snuff dippers, those guys that couldn't pronounce one-third of the Bible, yet they had wisdom. They had wisdom. Wisdom is not tied to education. Wisdom is tied to God, you see. But not only that, God promises in this Word divine healing. I believe I just am... I am secure enough in believing that God can heal whoever He wants to heal. There's miracle healing today. I know doctors do a lot. Scientists do a lot. But basically all healing comes from God. The Bible says 
the prayer of faith shall save the sick. But now there's a fourth thing. He promises in His Word that He will provide for our need. He will provide for our need. Here's what the Bible says. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. If God knows the lilies of the field, if God knows the birds that fall, surely God knows what I need. If I'm following Him, we have to be careful that we get, don't get confused with God giving us what we need and us not getting what we want. See, it's all about it's all about what is good for us. What is good for us? We might have a child that was crying to pick up a hot coal out of the fireplace. You know what you do? You deny that, wouldn't you? Sometimes our prayer is that far out, and God denies that that prayer. And then He promises to answer covenant prayers. Listen to this. Here's why it's important to pray as a congregation. Are to join forces two people, if you will, or three people praying. Again, the Bible says, I say unto you that if two of you shall, grow, shall agree on earth as touching anything, they shall ask, it shall be done unto them by my Father which is in heaven. I read an interesting story about uh, Dr. Truett, a preacher that preached in the 20s and the 30s. First Baptist of Dallas. Holding a revival. And he was preaching something along this line of God answering prayers. At the end of the service, a lady stood up and said, Preacher, do you believe the Bible? Do you believe what you're preaching? He said, Certainly I believe. He said, She said, But well, my husband is lost. He's a riverboat captain. But I'm going to try to get him to come to church this week. I want you, will you covet with me that God will save him during this, during this revival? Ah. <laughs> uh, Truett said, I, I hesitated. And when I hesitated, there's a man on the other side stood up and said, Lady, I'll come with you. I believe God's going to save your husband. And they met at the front and prayed. Well, that night, now revivals, let me tell you how revivals used to be. Now we have revival nets. We start on Sunday morning, we end on Wednesday night. That ain't the way it was when I was a boy. You started on Sunday and sometimes you didn't know when to quit. But normally in Baptist churches you went two or three weeks and you had a service every morning and you had a service every night. Every night. Y'all remember that, don't you? And so they, that night, he showed up with his wife, the riverboat kept. He showed up. Dr. Truett said, Praise the Lord, he's going to get saved tonight. Now, don't we ever try to second guess God, okay? So he said, I preached, man, I preached hard and, and gave an invitation, and he didn't come. But he said, as I got ready to preach in that sermon the next morning, he said, there's knock at the door. And a riverboat captain said, Listen, preacher, you got to tell me how to get saved right now. I can't wait until you give the invitation in the morning service. Covenant prayer. Covenant prayer. If you've got a heavy load on your heart, heavy burden of death to bear, ask somebody to covet prayer with you. Where two or three, he said, are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Now, this may seem like a kind of a dumb question, but why do we pray? You ever thought about that and answer that question in your heart? Why do you pray? Well, most of our prayer is when we're in trouble. But that ain't the way it should be. You see, first of all, I think the number one, we pray to get something from God. You say, well, that's selfish. I don't think so. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, Lord, give us our daily bread. Lord, I'm going to consume that. I need that daily bread. We pray, we pray to get something from God. We can learn a lot from our kids on this. They operate on COD. Y'all know what COD is? Call them dad. <laughs> that's, that's the way they operate, and that's the way we need to operate with God. Call on our Father. Call on our Father in heaven. But then, we need to pray. When we pray, we pray sometimes to prevent worry. Let, uh, Philippians 4, 6. Listen to what this verse says. Be careful for nothing, 
But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto the Lord. John Wesley said this. John Wesley said, I would no more worry than I would cuss. I would no more worry than I would cuss. Psalm said this. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his trouble. Now man, ain't that a lot better than word? Just let God answer a prayer. Let God take care of it. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Do you know how many years it took me to understand what I meant? I thought God was saying, upon this church, I'm going to use you to build my church. That ain't what He was saying at all. Hey, I ain't nothing. No preacher's nothing. It's all about God. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. God just called me to build a delivery boy. He didn't call me to be or build nothing. I had a friend growing up. I didn't have any brothers or sisters, but I had a friend named Jesse Ray. Jesse Ray Flanks. We were lived next door. He was my third cousin. We're like brothers. Well, we got grown and, and he moved to join the Navy and he wound up in California. And every now and then he'd call me, come see me sometimes when he was visiting his parents here. But you know, I haven't heard from him in probably 40 years. You know why? We just stopped communicate somehow we didn't have time folks that what being the way it is with God if you stop praying now God will never move when you stop praying you're the one that's doing doing the moving now why in the world does God not answer every prayer that we pray why does God not give us everything that we want well I tell you the main reason is this our prayers are never voiced to God we don't pray like we should. James, in his writing, said, You have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask not. Henry Ford had a friend that was an insurance salesman, one of his dearest friends. Henry Ford bought a million dollar life insurance from another agent. <laughs> and his friend said, Henry, why didn't you buy that for me? And Henry Ford said, Well, you didn't ask me to. Well, you have not because you ask not. Don't be afraid to ask God for anything. It doesn't matter how wicked it may seem. It doesn't matter how self-centered it may be. Just ask God. It may not be as self-centered as you think it is. Remember, God loves you. Don't leave that out of the equation. So miners were trapped in a mine that was a cave in. For three days they spent in that mine. Twenty-one of them. When they were finally rescued, somebody said, what did y'all do those three days? You know what they said? We prayed. Of course they prayed. They said that was a never, never a moment when somebody wasn't praying. They needed God's help. Now sometimes we pray with a wrong motive. We pray amiss. Amiss means that I don't need it. I pray for something that's selfish. But I'd rather for God to say no than for me to make all the assumptions that God's going to say that. What I'm saying, if I want something, pray for it. God ain't going to give it to me if I don't need it. Just pray for it. Why am I praying this prayer? Two things you need to ask yourself. Why am I praying this prayer? What's the purpose of it? Well, somebody sick to get healing, isn't it? If we're hungry, is to get fed. Number two, what will I do with it if God answers my prayer? What will I do with it if God answers my prayer? Then sometimes we pray with the wrong spirit within our heart. Here's what the Bible says. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. During the Depression, there's a fellow that made $18 a week, and I'm telling you, he was top wage earner. My daddy worked 35 cents a day during the Great Depression, shelling peanuts. People were desperate. Were desperate. But this man making $18. His boss was over at his house one night and they talking about paying the property tax. And the, his boss said, You know, I ain't been able to pay my property tax in two years. This fellow said, Well, we managed to do that. He said, How'd you do that? 
He said, I put a little here, put a little bit here, and a little bit there, and kind of saved it. So the next day, the boss man called him and said, well, I don't need you anymore to work. You're well, you better off than I am. You're fired. And this man's wife became bitter. She became bitter, bitter, bitter. And she prayed and asked God to give her husband another job. Nothing happened. She prayed. And then she read that verse. If, we, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. She went to this man and told him how she felt about him and apologized and asked him to forgive her. You know when her husband got another job? Next day. God will not hear a prayer if you've got bitterness in your heart. Sometimes we're not abiding in Christ. That is, we're not keeping His commandments. You say, wait a minute now, I ain't keeping the Ten Commandments. I said, His commandments. Love. <laughs> That's His commandment. It's all built around love. Love one another, He said. He said, if you abide in Me and My Word abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Let me illustrate this way. As a man who took his, his boy to college, they unloaded the stuff and they got to his dorm room and he handed the boy a check book and said, Son, as long as you act right, as long as you live the way that I've taught you to live, you write a check for whatever you need, whatever you've got to have, and I'll work hard and cut. The day you got saved, God handed you his checkbook. Amen. He handed you his checkbook. You need something? From glory, write the check. You need something to heal you, write the check. But you see, it's built around us living the way God wants us to. And sometimes, we're just not earnest enough. Moses said, Lord, answer my prayer, kill me. <laughs> now, that's praying since then. Answer my prayer or kill me. Jacob said to the angel as he wrestled with it, I'm not let you go unless you bless me. There got to be determination in your praying. Got to be determination. John Knox said, "Give me Scotland or give me dead." The Bible says, "The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much." Years ago, you've well, not been married maybe five or six years. Her parents getting on up age. They didn't have a home. And she started praying for her mom and dad to have a home. And I thought, oh man, a little thing. Ain't no way that can happen. I didn't say it out loud, but in my heart, oh doubtful me, I was saying, there ain't no way. <coughs> Two years later, it happened. i tell you, that woman's got a lot of power, a lot of power to God. I just don't think that's so. I was telling Miss Carolyn, story my son-in-law told me. He said this the governor and his wife was going through the hometown and said they passed by a construction crew there on the road and, and he looked at his wife and said, Ain't that the guy you used to ain't that the guy you used to date? Just think, he said, if you'd married that guy, you'd been married to a dictionary. She said, no, honey, if I married that man, I'd be married to a governor. <laughs> <laughs> a woman makes you a virtue. Makes you a virtue. Loves the Lord and loves you. And sometimes we're just not submissive to the will of God. Just not submissive to the will of God. It's an April night on Sunday, 19 and 12. A woman can't sleep. She's tossing and turning. And there's just a great burden on her heart. She begins to pray and pray for her husband. Pray for the safety of her husband. He was coming on the Titanic. And she began to pray and pray and pray. Now the Titanic was supposed to be unsinkable, remember? She prayed she could not sleep. About five o'clock, all of a sudden a great peace came over her. And she was able to get to sleep. 
On the Titanic, it had been hit by an iceberg and was about to sink. And her husband was helping other people, trying to get the children and the women into lifeboats. But finally, the ship sank, and as, that, uh, as the water began to twirl down, he was sucked down into the ocean. He swam in ice-cold water, and finally, he came up. And when he came up, there was a lifeboat that had been turned over. He and some of his friends got in that boat, or all the pastors got in that boat, now listen, at 5 o'clock that morning, they were picked up by an angel. Prayer. Prayer. Prayer is what's on all that. Bow with me as we get ready for our invitation. Dear Lord God, thank you for the power of prayer. Sometimes, Lord, we can't always identify it like this. You want one we could. But Lord, though we may not identify it, just exactly when you answer our prayers, exactly how you answer our prayers. God, we know the promise of the Bible is true. You said you, said you would answer our prayers. God, that was a promise you made. Now, Lord, we have some, we have some things here that we, need, that we need you to answer. We need healing for some people. God, we need healing for Ellie. We need healing for Rhonda's husband. Lord, we need healing for Yvonne. We need healing for Miss Carolyn and Miss Carolyn. God, we got some folks here that just need to be healed. And God, that's what we pray for. I know, God, you're able to do it. You're powerful enough to do any, anything, Lord. And God, we need some other things. Lord, Lord, we need some people saved. We need some people coming into the church. And Lord, some other things. We need an exciting spirit to come into the church. And Lord, we need to get excited again about being saved and what you're going to do with us, Lord. Now as we sing this invitation song, God, I pray if there's anybody here that wants to come forward and pray or come forward for any other purpose, Lord, I pray they'll do it as we sing. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me now and let's sing what number you got. One eight three. One eight three.